Hi, my name is Samantha Mullen, and I'm going to be talking about physiological responses in gray tree frog species that are freeze tolerant, such as Dryophytes chrysoceles, Dryophytes versicolor, and we're also going to talk about the mechanisms of crowd protection and how that can be used to benefit the science of organ transplantation. So, my outline is just going to talk about the introduction, backgrounds, knowledge gap, hypothesis, um, my experimental designs, and a conclusion. So first we need to talk about why is there a problem? And the problem is that frogs, such as the gray tree frog species you can see right here, are poikilothermic ectotherms, meaning they have a variable body temperature range and they get their heat, body heat from the surrounding environment. This means that during the winter seasons, it can be deadly to them. And if there's a temperature below what they can withstand, they probably won't survive. But there are mechanisms to avoid this. And that brings me to talk about freeze avoidance and freeze tolerance. Freeze avoidance is when an animal can avoid freezing in lower temperatures, while freeze, freeze tolerance is when an animal can freeze entirely and still survive post-thawing. They both use a mechanism of supercooling, meaning cooling a liquid below its freezing point without it becoming a solid. And they do this by using antifreeze proteins and osmolites, but we'll talk about that later. So freeze tolerant frogs, like the gray tree frog species as you see, can freeze more than two thirds of their total body fluids. First, we're gonna talk about the hibernaculum in the regions and how it can affect or possibly affect them. So a study by Ir Irwin and Lee of 2003 proposed that there was an evolutionary connection between these two species. They said that Chrysoceles species was diploid, meaning it has two sets of chromosomes per cell while its relative versicolor is tetraploid, meaning it has four. And these two scientists believe that the versicolor species, since it was more genetically complex, was capable of generating more osmolites and thus being superior to its relative um, when it came to freeze tolerance. However, they found that the hibernaculum, or where they sought refuge, was the same, which was just under leaf litters on the floor or the ground wherever they were living, um, which provided them insulation or just added insulation during the freezing seasons. And then the only other thing they found was that the dry fighting's versicolor species was only found slightly more, nor more northern than its relative. So as you can see on the map, the blue is the versicolor, while yellow is chrysoceles. Chrysoceles was found very su southern and northern, while versicolor was much more northern. However, there was overlap, as you can see in the green. And while this section does experience a lot more harsh winters, this section does experience some bad winters too. So it kind of showed these uh, scientists that maybe it doesn't have as grave effect as they had thought. Um, what they ended up finding that was that overall, hibernaculum in regions may have a little effect but what it really came down to was seasonal, seasonal conditioning and the acclimation time they had to acclimate to those freezing temperatures. And now we're gonna talk about how the great tree frogs actually survive freezing. What mechanism do they go under? And that's using crab protectants, otherwise known as osmolites, which synthesize in the liver, liver via gluconeogenesis. And that's where glycerol and glucose is formed. Um, but how do those get to the rest of the body? How do they not just stay in the liver? And that's through aquaporins. And aquaporins are small integral mem membrane proteins found in the cell membrane. And that basically allows osmolites to either uptake or release from the liver. It has to be present in the liver for this to happen and for the osmolites to go to the rest of the body and tissues. Um, Goldstein, Amaral, Stogsdill, and Zimmerman were all key articles I found that talked about HC9 which was the primary aquaporin, aquaporin that facilitated this. Um, so this aquaporin had to be present in the liver as well as synthesized glycerol glucose had to be present for these frogs to survive this freezing. And once that happens, it can, the osmolites can systemically accumulate and protect the tissues against freezing or cryo injury. Overall, Glucose and glycerol acts as an antifreeze to prevent intracellular fluids from freezing while extracellular fluids freeze. 
This essentially just pre prevents the formation of ice crystals intracellulary, intracellulary so that the cells don't get ruptured or affected by ice crystals damaging them. And so the articles I found all had very similar experimentation styles. And what they all did was they took mature male gray tree frogs and collected them. They were fed a regular diet of crickets, mealworms, and maggots. And then once they started showing signs of met metabolic depression and didn't eat as much, they started to acclimate the frogs from five degrees Celsius for two to four weeks down to one degree Celsius. The frogs were then frozen by either placing them in cold water baths, um, putting cold aeros aerosol onto tubes containing the frogs, or by directly placing ice on a wet paper towel the frogs were on. And then the frogs were frozen from negative five degrees Celsius for 24 to 48 hours. After freezing, they were thawed for an additional 24 hours and then checked for survivability. Survivability was just to indicate, were they alive, are they damaged? And they did that by trying to see, were they remaining proper posture? Were they breathing right? Were they jumping again? Were they reacting to stimuli, etc.? cetera? Um, so then when they verified the frogs were surviving. They sacrificed the frogs by double pithing, or piping, excuse me, and that just destroyed their spinal cord. Um, some other articles did overdose the frogs with anesthesia, just any type of humane method to put them, put, to put them down. Um, and then the blood collected from the, the blood was collected from the heart and severed vessels. The liver, kidney, and other samples were flash frozen with liquid nitrogen. And then the extracts were all homogenized with perchloric acid and neutralized with KOH. All samples were then assayed for plasma osmolality concentrations of glycerol and glucose. And here's the graph I created and integrated from these three different articles. And as you can see, the dry fighting versi color had a larger range of plasma osmolality, um, while the dry fighting chrysosceles had a much smaller range. However, when you compare these two on averages, there was only about a plus or minus 30 milliosmal per kilogram difference, meaning that while this one might have had a greater range of plasma osmolalities, they both generally made a very similar amount on average. Thus, they weren't very different when it came to the amount of osmolality, osmolality concentrations needed to survive freezing. And that brings me to how we can use this knowledge. So um, it may not be known, it, may not, it might be, but human organs can only last outside of the living host for no more than 12 hours about. And the heart's about four to six hours, livers and kidneys about six to 12 hours. But the ideal temperature for human organs is four to eight degrees Celsius. Above eight degrees Celsius, you get hypoxic injuries. Lower than that, you get cold injury and protein denaturation. But there's a crucial need for being able to give organs a longer preservation time, and freezing might be that answer. Because some organs can go bad very quickly if they're not kept exactly in this range and exactly within this time frame. So what if we could freeze them below freezing or in sub-zero temperatures and preserve them better? And this image is just showing you a liver of a rat that is being super cold. Um, I just thought it was neat to put in there because it just shows that there is actually people out there trying to do this now. So my hypothesis for this experiment would be that if ma mammalian organs were preserved and injected with an osmolite concentration of glycerol and glucose greater than 400 milliosmoles per kilogram, they would be able to withstand sub-zero temperatures without damage and lengthen preservation times. So here's my experiment that I've designed. First, we would need approval from Wright State's Institution of Animal Care and Use Committee to make sure we're not going against any animal welfare laws. And then we need um, approval from the Biosafety Committee, which would just ensure that we're using the proper lab, such as a Biosafety Level 2 lab on campus, and disposing of biohazardous material properly. So first, I want to say that um, I think it would be best to start with a smaller mammalian species, such as rats and then work your way up to larger species until you get to humans, because human organs are very crucial and they're needed constantly, um, every second. People are on the list. And it's, it's, just, it's just very important not to waste those human organs. So we wanna do experimentations on a smaller organ first, a smaller species, 
so that there's not as much waste and that we can um, prevent that and save some time and make sure this is successful before wasting any crucial human hearts or kidneys, etc. So we're gonna use mature male rats, which would be euthanized, and extract their livers, kidneys, and hearts. Then we would use control organs by placing them in a uh, bag full of Celsior. Celsior is just a liquid that's used as an organ preservation in the metal medical industry now. And then we would freeze it. And the experimental, experimental organs will be injected and soaked in varying osmolic concentrations. So that would be at 250 milliosmoles, 350, and 450. And then the temperatures will be acclimated starting at four to eight degrees Celsius and slowly go down to zero degrees Celsius for five hours. Organs will be frozen for 24 hours at negative five degrees Celsius. And then upon thawing, organs will be transplanted into living rodents, put under anesthesia, and monitored for the next few days or weeks, depending on survivability or if there's any signs of organ rejection. This is a graph that I came up with to show my expected results. As you can see, um, with ambient temperature on the x-axis and osmolite concentration on the y-axis, I hypothesize that as osmolite concentration increases, these organs will be able to survive sub-zero temperatures. So about 400 to 500 degrees, 400 to 500 milliosmoles per, per kilogram, excuse me, these uh, organs will be able to survive between zero to negative five degrees Celsius and still be viable for transplantation afterwards. But at around 100 milliosmoles, they wouldn't be able to survive over here. So in conclusion, gray tree frog species utilize osmolites and prevent, to prevent cellular damage um, from ice formations and survive sub-zero temperatures. These mechanis mechanisms can be utilized to benefit the science of organ transplantation, as well as using the knowledge behind supercooling and freeze tolerance can possibly help to cryopreserve human organs and have them still remain viable for transplantation. So here's my references, and that's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, please raise your hand.